Well, I think every generation um, makes the books that um, contain it, the hopes and dreams it wants to pass on to the next generation. And you can see that going back to the beginning, which um, would be the uh, end of the 17th century, when colonists in New England uh, produced books which were designed to train their children to read the Bible at the youngest possible age, so they would be able to prepare themselves for the afterlife. That was a religious perspective, and that was one of the dominant um, um, concerns of children's books for the next hundred or so years. Of course, not everyone um, shared the, that religious emphasis, and many books began to appear in the colonies in the 18th century, which were, uh, for the most part, imported from England, um, and which focused on the here and now. Um, but um, through the philosophy of um, John um, Locke, who had um, said that it was important to view children as rational beings, not um, children who were born with original sin, which is what the Puritans had said, but um, that these were children who were going to go out into the world if they survived their first years and perhaps have a life different from that which their parents had lived. And so they needed to become literate and they needed to um, have books which were geared to their uh, abilities as, um, as children, books with pictures, books with a little bit of humor, sometimes books that were as much for fun as they were about learning. Um, so th those books um, reflected a very different philosophy of childhood from the ones the Puritans had had. Um, on into the 19th century, um, when America was a new nation, uh, you, uh, by the 1820s, Americans began to feel that they should be producing their own children's books, no longer just importing them from England. And you start to see something like Manifest Destiny expressing itself in nonfiction books, uh, which are all about um, the rest of the world, all the things that a child might want to know who someday would grow up to inherit them. Uh, you know, what is Europe like? What is America like? What is the sun, the moon, and the stars like? There was a man named Peter Parley uh, who wrote something like 200 books on all these different subjects. You wonder how he knew so much, and in fact, I think he made up some of what he said, but he presented it as nonfiction. Um, and then just to add one more uh, layer to this, um, since this is a, you know, a big question, um, after the Civil War, um, there was a big shift because um, up until that time, there was always a moral um, layer to these books. There was, this is what a good child should know, or this is how a good child should behave. And often there'd be a story in which a good child was opposed to, uh, to a naughty child. And it was very clear which was which. After the Civil War, when Americans had um, experienced such horror and had been forced to question everything they knew about morality, um, I think the writers for children felt less sure of themselves, and they became more open to fiction in which um, characters behaved in uh, the more ambiguous ways that we associate with literature as opposed to morality tales. And so you would then begin to find stories, um, the epitome of which might be uh, considered to be um, Tom Sawyer, where you have a, 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 a mischievous child, a, you know, a quote, bad child, who is the hero, because, not because everything he does is what we might approve of, but because everything he does is what we recognize as part of human behavior as it really is. So um, that gives you a flavor for how, from one generation, generation to another, um, the assumptions and the philosophy and the ideas underlying children's books can change and reflect the experiences of the larger culture.